This channel, MSNBC, was founded as a cable TV channel in 1996. But it was not until about 10 years into MSNBC's life that this channel really began to solidify its place in the market and really started to take off. In, in the interim years, in that first decade, one of the things that MSNBC did that people do not believe this company did, one of the things MSNBC did that seems patently impossible in retrospect, but I know for a fact it did indeed happen, one of the things MSNBC did in its first decade was it broadcast a TV show for 23 weeks that was called Alan Keyes is Making Sense. Also, a reminder that the chat room tonight is busier than the clerk's office at the Ninth Circuit Court. <laughs> there are some other folks who believe that the mere fact that I raised that question proves that I'm some kind of nut. Maureen, Maureen, so it is not. A I'm sorry. Of Maureen, power hold up. Maureen, stop Allen, there, please. Not don't, primarily don't talk a crisis over me. of sex. Don't talk over me. Well, cut your mic off if you don't stop when I start. Clips from Alan Keyes is Making Sense. That's the name of the show. If you have to assert in the name of the show that the host is making sense, it tells you something about what people think the appeal of that host might be. You will know that a new truth-telling but worried overlord has taken over this network when this show's name gets changed to Rachel's Maddow, Rachel Maddow's Blazers Sure Fit Good. Uh, but it was Alan Keyes is Making Sense uh, that I thought of first thing uh, when Michelle Bachman did this on the campaign trail in Iowa this week. Before we get started, let's all say happy birthday to Elvis Presley today. Happy birthday. Michelle Bachman said that not on Elvis Presley's birthday, but on the anniversary of the day that Elvis Presley died. Uh, then there was uh, this from Michelle Bachman during a radio interview yesterday. What people recognize is that there's a fear that the United States is in an unstoppable decline. They see the rise of China, the rise of India, the rise of uh, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, you may also remember Michelle Bachman on the campaign trail saying she was proud to be from Waterloo, Iowa, because that's where John Wayne was from. Well, what I want them to know is just like John Wayne was from Waterloo, Iowa, that's the kind of spirit that I have, too. The John Wayne, who is from Waterloo, Iowa, is not John Wayne, the movie star, but rather John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer, executed in the mid-1990s. Michelle Bachman also earlier this year gave a big shout out to Lexington and Concord for their role in the Revolutionary War. She did this while she was in New Hampshire, not as a shout out to a neighboring state or a generic yay New England or an even more generic yay America. She did it when she was in New Hampshire because she thought that the Massachusetts towns of Lexington and Concord actually were towns in New Hampshire. What I love about New Hampshire and what we have in common is our extreme love for liberty. You're the state where the shot was heard around the world at Lexington and Concord. No. I, you know, people make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time, constantly. Candidates make mistakes. Candidates do not usually make this many mistakes, though. And here's the thing about whether or not gaffes like this, repeated constant gaffes like this from Michelle Bachman are important politically for her. Michelle Bachman, as far as I can tell, like Alan Keyes, Michelle Bachman is making sense. Her candidacy makes sense. There's a reason why more than a gadfly, less than a contender conservative candidacies are such an important part of the way Republicans run for president. When Alan Keyes ran for president in the year 2000, one of the concrete outcomes of that was him getting a TV show on the cables, which not only paid him, of course, but also helped him maintain his influence. He ran for president again in 2008 and he runs for Senate every time you turn around. He even moved to Illinois at one point to run against Barack Obama for Senate in 2004. For running for office is a career strategy for Alan Keyes. Pat Robertson ran for president in 1988 when he was already a very successful televangelist. Pat Robertson came in second at the Iowa caucuses. He got lots of attention before parlaying all of that into all sorts of ways to make money and maintain his influence. He even spoke at the Republican convention that year. His television empire grew. Since then, he has published about a dozen books. Plus, there was the thing about the diamond mine he owned with the dictator in Liberia. Uh, plus, he has his age-defying shake recipe that he says allows him to leg press 2,000 pounds when he wants, even though he's 81. Like Alan Keyes, being more than a gadfly but less than a contender as a candidate was a very good thing for Pat Robertson's career. It was also good for Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee won the Iowa caucuses. Was he ever going to win the Republican nomination? Who cares? When all was said and done, what he was was a Fox News commentator with his own show called Huckabee with Mike Huckabee. 
He's published four more books since his presidential run, plus audiobooks. He's got his conservative revisionist history DVDs for kids. One of the reasons Mike Huckabee said he wasn't going to run this time is he said he'd be walking away from a pretty good income. There is not a, there is a reason that there, there is not a, a broad Democratic Party parallel here. I mean, there are individual Democratic candidates here and there who have tried to do the same thing. But the Republicans do this wholesale. Every year, a lot of their candidates are following this path. And that's because the conservative movement, which overlaps with but is not the same thing as the Republican Party, the conservative movement is in constant need of conservative celebrities. They have created this market and they need a product to sell to that market. Becoming a conservative media celebrity is a really remunerative thing. The speaking tours and the publications and the book clubs and the direct mail and the giant TV network and the smaller TV networks and the religious TV networks. The conservative movement needs celebrities. People who, whether or not they have won political offices, are famous for being conservative. They just need to be well known. They need name recognition. They need to say reliably conservative headline grabbing things. And a presidential campaign is a great platform to do that. It's a great place to build the brand, as they say. Whether or not every twist and turn and mix up between the serial killer and the movie star uh, is a newsworthy thing this year, I, I think that is up to the individual news agency to decide on about Michelle Bachman's candidacy. But whether or not the more than a gadfly, less than a contender candidates like Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum and Herman Cain, whether or not those folks stay in the race, that isn't really a judgment call. That isn't really a mystery. That, like Alan Keyes, is making sense. Joining us now is Chris Hayes, editor at large of The Nation magazine and soon to be host of his own MSNBC weekend show starting next month. Chris, it is good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. I think I think all uh, cable news hosts should be showed the clips from the Alan Keyes is making sense <laughs> in case anyone's head starts to get too big that they have a cable news show. The title of the Alan Keyes show, the name of the show is Alan sweet. Keyes is making sense, is one of the most profound things to have ever happened it's in cable sweet. news. It's pretty sweet. I was trying to think about the parallel. I mean, I, mean, I went with... Rachel Maddow's blazers fit well, like just to try to undercut. <laughs> Which was that. adorable and self-deprecating. I don't know if I don't know if it's exactly proper. I was, you know, I was trying to. I mean, you try if you're trying to, to advance your critics, their argument with yes, the title of your right. show. I don't know. It's a challenge to all of us. <laughs> all right, are you going to be telling me that I am underestimating Michelle Bachman at my peril in this campaign? Rachel, I really think you're underestimating Michelle Bachman. I, no, I, I. Well, here's what I think you're underestimating. I, I do think you're underestimating the megalomania and self-delusion of people that run for president of the United States. I mean, I, I, it's unclear to me how self-conscious the strategy is. I think you're exactly right about the broad structure of the incentives and the monetary, intense monetary incentives for people on the right who run for president. Um, and the Sarah Palin phenomenon itself is it sort of blew open all the barriers. But I do think, and it's impossible possible to kind of get like a soul x-ray. But I do think in her heart of hearts, Michelle Bachman thinks she has a chance of being the next president of the United States. I think her husband probably thinks that. And I think the small knit circle of advisors around there probably think that too. And I think all sorts of people who have no chance of actually being president of the United States manage to convince themselves that they will in fact be the next president of the United States. Well, why, why don't we see, and, and tell me if you disagree with the premise, but I don't think we see the same thing happening as much with Democratic presidential candidates. I think there's the odd one here and there, but I do feel like it happens wholesale with Republicans, and it really is an odd thing when it happens with, with Democrats. Do you think that it's, it's true that there isn't balance here on both sides? I think there's an imbalance in the scale, and I think that's just largely about the fact that conservatism in America is a multi-billion dollar industry, I mean, self-consciously conservative conservatism, um, it, it, there's a whole universe of platforms. I mean, there are people, Rachel, who there are radio talk show hosts that almost no one who is watching this program right now have even heard of who have millions of people that listen to them every day. Yeah. I mean, you could you could go to the New York Times bestseller list on any given Sunday and you will see four or five right-wing authors on that New York seller best list. Sometimes people I have never heard of, and I sort of think about this and cover this for a living. So there is an entire universe, an entire industry, and it dwarfs the scale of whatever there is on the left. And this is not to say, I mean, look, I write for the Nation, uh, the Nation magazine, which that's how we make money, is selling subscriptions to liberals. There is nothing wrong with it 
per se. It's just the size of it is so large. And also, I think there is a question of, at a certain point, whether people are, are doing this for the right reasons, whether they're sort of ideological warriors or whether they are. this is essentially a racket. And it becomes harder and harder to tease the two apart. And the, the, whether or not, what it tells us about them as individual candidates and the potential trajectory of them as candidates and what it says about whether they're delusional people or good people or bad people and all that, that is sort of the most personally interesting part of it. Yeah. But I think it also has a political impact. And I wonder if it might be possible, even sort of just informally, to separate off, to hive off the people totally. who really are running just as a racket, just to build their brand and get other jobs, to separate them off from the people who are really running to be president, because the presence of the brand builders makes the actual presidential contest just that much more stupid and craven. I totally agree, and yet what would be the hypothetical decision procedure that one could plausibly apply to the field to do that separation. I mean, you know, Michelle Bachman is polling quite well, thank you very much. Yeah. There are, I mean, there are certain candidates who are, were excluded from the stage in the last Fox News debate. Gary Johnson, who was a very successful governor of New Mexico, and Buddy, Buddy Romer, who we had on the last word last week, who is not only a governor of Louisiana, but he was a congressman. You know, people with, with, with credible records who are not on that stage, I don't think are running for, you know, to be celebrities. But if you say, well, you know, Herman Cain is just, is just running for this reason, Herman Cain's saying, no, I'm running because I want to be the next president of the United States and I have the fundraising dollars to show it. It's, it's very hard to think of how you would go about making that separation. But I agree that it does produce a circus atmosphere for sure, particularly in the early stages of the Republican primary. Chris Hayes of MSNBC and The Nation magazine, obviously cleaning up. Uh, thank you so much for your <laughs> <That's> time. <right. laughs> thank, thank you, you Rachel. Thanks, Mostly The Nation. Yeah, yeah I understand. <laughs> Filthy lucre. All right. 